there we go. Thank you to everybody who's here today. Um, we may have a few more joining us. So if I do a little pause when I'm talking, it's because I may be letting somebody in through the waiting room. But we want to keep our times um, quite sharp because I know everybody's very busy. Um, so we'll look to get going. Hello and welcome to the first Pathways to Action event, How Can Museums Inspire Radical Climate Action in Their Communities? I'm Nicola Henderson. I'm the Innovation and Network Manager for Museums in Heritage Highland, um, or MHH. MHH is a network organisation working with the Highland heritage sector to help them become more resil resilient and sustainable. We launched in late 2019 and therefore most of our work has been focused on supporting the sector through the pandemic. So this is our first event focused on looking at how museums can be centres of change in their community in relation to the climate emergency, but I'm very sure this won't be our last. I'm delighted today to be joined by four inspiring speakers who bring examples of projects that have inspired communities around the world to think about how climate change is affecting them, to think about what listening to our past can teach us about our future, and to think about the steps, small and big, we need to take in order to build a positive future. Before we get started, I'd like to outline a few house rules for today. As you'll have noticed, today's session is being held as a meeting, as opposed to a webinar, to help enable a more fluid conversation in the panel discussion at the end. So can I ask that you please keep your camera and audio off during the speaker presentations. Um, during the Q&A section at the end, please use the raise hand function under the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. And our moderator for the discussion, my colleague Helen Avenel, will get to every question we can in the allotted time. Please do then switch on your audio and your camera if you'd like to, although that is not essential if you prefer not to. Um, and then you can ask your question direct to the panelists and hopefully we can have a really fluid and inspiring conversation. Please note that this session is being recorded, um, so if you wish to remain unseen, I recommend keeping your camera off throughout the meeting. Please also do use the chat function to raise any points, um, network with attendees or share ideas. We will also post video links in the chat for you to watch later, as I'm sure you may um, be aware by now that watching videos via Zoom can sometimes be a little, little stuttery. Um, all right, that's enough for me. Um, it's time to get going um, and invite our first speaker forward. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Rowan Gard. Uh, Dr. Rowan is an environmental social scientist, educator and museums professional with research experience in environmental degradation and climate change resilience, as well as the environmental and societal impacts of economic globalisation. Presently, she is a research fellow at University College London, teaches at the University of Edinburgh and is a trustee with Friends of the Earth Scotland. Today, Rowan is going to be speaking to us about the Reimagining Museums for Climate Action project and framing it in the context of COP26. Um, Dr. Rowan, if I could pass to you. Thank you, Nicola. I'll just go ahead and share my screen then. So just a moment. All right, I'm hopeful that, is everyone seeing that then full screen? Yeah, great. All right, well, thank you again, Nicola. And I'll go ahead and share um, a little bit about the Reimagining Museums for Climate Action project and the resulting exhibition that's currently at the Glasgow Science Centre. So the project and exhibition started out as a call to colleagues and museum professionals, as well as other folks more broadly, to rethink museums, uh, what they could be for, how they could better serve the communities that they're in. Uh, that call went out in the autumn of 2020. And from that time, we received hundreds of proposals for exhibits to be part of the larger exhibition that's now at Glasgow. And um, from those hundreds of exhibitions that were or proposals for pieces of the exhibit, if that makes sense, we selected and long listed 79. So if you can see my arrow, I'm just gonna point to what this diagram is, is the second floor of the Glasgow Science Center. And we have included information on the long listed participants here in the physical space. And we've dedicated a lot of energy, especially because it's been the pandemic, to creating a digital experience to the exhibition. Um, and then we selected eight shortlisted candidates that fill out these exhibition spaces, as you see here in the darker squares. We're especially proud of this project as it brings together teams from around the world. And it is also part of the UK Arts and Humanities Heritage Priority Areas contribution to the uh, UN's Climate Conference or COP that will be opening, of course, uh, and commencing next month in Glasgow. So I hope then that that all makes sense. I'm going to walk us through this space. So you'll get a taste of the different exhibits within the larger exhibition. And happily, my colleague Walter is here. 
speak to one of the exhibitions that he's contributed to. So you're greeted then when you come into this space down this long corridor by the Museum of Open Windows. And each of our contributors asked a key question. What if museums became centers for community-led climate research and action? And projected then on these digital screens are different um, information and recordings that have been collected by communities around the world. They're very sh short snippets. They generally have been submitted to us via Twitter and Instagram, and they're capturing moments of change for people in their communities. Now, moving on to existences, which will be uh, what Walter will speak to in just a bit. Their key question was, what if museums were small, small places that supported, supported communities in addressing local climate challenges and actions? And they pulled together pieces of art and video. And this information, of course, can be delved into deeper on the exhibition website. Um, but really then kind of pulling this all together, this next image gives you a sense of what that feels like to experience it in the museum. Um, with a number of the models there of the geodesic domes that they proposed as those types of centers might, might look like. All right then, moving then to number three, the Natural Futures Museum. And their key question was, what if indigenous lands were thought of as a kind of museum for climate action? And there's a number of films that you can watch and you can see this, uh, the la uh, larger image on the right hand side of the screen depicts almost like a, a mini theater that we created on the floor uh, for um, visitors to engage with this films. And these films have been made, uh, created by indigenous filmmakers, especially around what's happening in the Amazon. Now, moving on, I, I appreciate I'm going rather quickly here, but we don't have a lot of time together. So I'm hoping to give you sort of a whirlwind experience of the exhibit and then some of the information and resources that are coming out of that for you to explore yourselves. Uh, our fourth exhibitor is gathering with us. And um, what if museums been, themselves contributed to real climate action through their fabric materials? So what if they could help absorb carbon or help to uh, clean a space that they might be locating themselves in a community? And I really love this display. It's actually, if you were to visit in person, we also have some video clips where you see that the, uh, the pendulum type device that's in the center there is moving around, carving uh, different lines into the sand that's underneath it. And that has to do with the actual data sets around the carbon in the atmosphere. So they really proposed digging into ways that the buildings themselves and the grounds of museums could help to absorb carbon for their communities. Now moving on to uh, a little closer to home, the Dundee Museum of Transport put together this piece of the exhibition and they have uh, a very practical question. How can museums support the move to climate friendly technology and lifestyles? And this is part of their, their bigger overhaul that they've been working on. Um, and it'll be exciting to see that when they move into their new locations, their, excuse me, their new location here in Dundee. Now, moving forward to number six, which is the elephant in the room. It's a video installation as well as some of the artwork that you're seeing there in those images. It's a short film, I believe it's just under five minutes. And it explores um, the question of what museums and societies were forced to confront their role in climate change. It also brings to bear uh, lenses that involve decolonization in museum space, as well as a feminist perspective. Story Whip is number seven, um, and they are proposing people curate their own climate information to support climate action. And I know that a couple of these images are a bit pixelated, so apologies for that. But it's a really fascinating um, interface where you can collect pieces of data based on locations or based on ideas. So it can be uh, quite interactive and quite informative and something well worth checking out. And then our final exhibitor goes for um, a more intimate, I think, and uh, impersonal and informal style where they gather together materials that have meanings to people in, in communities. And their real question is, what if people gathered their own collections and information to support dialogue and climate action? So in a way to make the impersonal 
quite personal. Um, you can see that they've opted to display a number of idea, um, items related to climate change in their community on a ping pong table and display things uh, some, similar to what we might do in like a scrapbooking or if you're pasting things on the wall in an office or somewhat more informally than in a museum space. Now, um, events and engagement. For me, this is some of the most exciting elements of the exhibition. We are, especially in light of the pandemic, supporting a number of engagement opportunities that are online. Uh, there is education related activity entitled Curious About, which is currently on the Glasgow Science Center website. Uh, we're also engaging a program entitled Earth Allies, Creative Climate Connections. We've also had a radio spot for community radio in Glasgow and um, working on a number of engagement activities entitled Climate Cafe and uh, Spark Talks. So ways to engage the local as well as the UK more broadly and around the world. Any educator can download the information that's presented on the website, of course, free of charge. We also have a book associated with the uh, exhibition. It is being published and will be available in November and a toolkit. But the real wonderful aspects of this are these resources will be available to anyone to download uh, around the world for free. So I think that's really some exciting, exciting stuff coming out of there. And as our time is short, I'll just say uh, thank you so much. There's so many people to thank that the folks at the Glasgow Science Center have been amazing. Uh, my colleagues at the uh, RMCA team at UCL and obviously our network of contributors from around the world. And happily, um, I'll just wrap up and my colleague Walter can tell you a bit more about his contributions to our project. Thanks. Thanks, Rowan. That was a, a stop tour of the exhibition. And I would, if we can drop the, the link to the website in the chat, people can, can have a good look around a lot of the resources that are on there and um, people can have a uh, chance to have a conversation with Rowan in the Q&A towards the end. Um, I'll hand over next to Walter, um, who holds many prestigious positions, including postdoctoral researcher at the Laboratory of Studies in Theory, Historicity and Aesthetics of the Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. He's adjunct professor at the Federal University of Alfenas and is faculty member at the postgraduate program in Iberian history. He's also creator of the Existences Project, and he is here to discuss that with us today and give us a bit more of an in-depth look into that. Um, so Walter, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, I hope you are hearing me. Okay. Thank you very much, Nicola, for your introduction. Thank you, Roland, for your great presentation. It's a great pleasure to be, to be here with you guys today. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, I will share my screen and I hope you are seeing it. Okay, and uh, now I will start reading my presentation. Thank you very much. I am a historian interested in how the planetary transformations that we face nowadays impact our ability to tell stories. As it is increasingly clear that these changes are directly related to human activities, we should think about whether each one of us is or is not responsible to some extent for what has been called the Anthropocene. Thus, I started to reflect on the role that narratives can play in accelerating or postponing these transformations and soon became clear to me that museums are a significant part of this story. In my doctoral research, I aimed to contribute to these historiographical discussions about a transnational modernization process that took place between the 1920s and the end of the Second World War. Modernization and developmentalism configured persistent narratives from which Brazilian national independence would derive from the economic potential of the extractivist use of land. Going back in time, Christian and mercantilist metaphysics offered legitimacy to deforestation and meaning through slavery under colonial rule. The slavery persisted in Brazil until, 19, until 1888, but the narrative changed before it. 
Since the end of the 18th century, governmental legitimacy should be drawn from the lives of science, and both historians and museums played an important role in demonstrating how nature should be put at the service of civilization. At the same time, market transactions should regulate the relationship between these two different realms for the benefit of enlightened nations. While historians cast light on the subjects of the supposed inevitable modernization process, museums labeled lots of vibrant matters and beings as nature, that is, passive objects to be used for the sake of the nation. Showcases but a physical divide between who could observe and who, who should be observed. History activated the subjects, that is, white men, and museums domesticated objects, that is, from minerals and animals to indigenous peoples. From these national museums came the utilitarian knowledge, knowledge concerning almost everything or everyone, which or who must be put at the service of the subjects in charge of national progress, modernization, or more recently, development. The monumentality of these spaces invested them with an aura of a national heritage, which must last forever, no matter at which economic or ecological costs. But that's not the only story. This white male and destructive mode of existence was imposed on other more than human collectives since the invasion of the Americas in the late 15th century. But that doesn't mean their extinction. In Brazil, there are more than 300 indigenous peoples consisting of almost 900,000 people. In the same vein, Quilombola people, that is descendants of people who managed to escape enslavement in Brazil, form more than 5,000 communities spread across the country. Afro-indigenous cosmologies also form an important part of religious, artistic, and intellectual heritages of people who, who resist over centuries of colonial and extractivist activities. However, people who live under ways of life not based on the nature culture divide are constantly chased by heralds of the different forms of monocultures, either by lobbying or by, or by their armed militias. Their resistant ways of existing are under persistent threat. These multiple ways to assemble non-anthropocentric worlds constitute real possibilities to live under the anthropocenic pressure since this began parallel to European colonial expansion. Their existence were molded by continued resistance to the colonial expansion, uh, producing what the anthropologist Eduardo Vero de Castro called their existences, which we borrowed as a name of our project. They offer escape lines to the local effects of planetary change imposed by the promoters of the colonial way of life. These non-Western knowledges converged in different ways with the very recent Earth System Sciences conclusions. However, the scientists' geoengineering solutions are not necessarily concerned with the specific forms of environmental and climatic suffering experienced by these people long before the word Anthropocene was forged among scientists. But what do museums have to do with that? The reimagining museums for climate action proposition was a great opportunity to think about that. Here I use the word proposition as suggested by Bruno Latour, that is as something that knocks on the door of our collectives, asking for its right to live among us. In this case, the collectives in question are the heritage and the museum domains. The RMCA proposition is expressed by a couple of questions which, which start with the expression, what if? And this what if may be the difference of continuing telling stories or not. Actually, the proposition that the RMCA brought to us was made before by the very earth system who told us that there is no more a stable environment to be tamed. To keep big museums working as usual has a more and more expensive cost. The big cities where they can found are less and less habitable. 
the onto epistemology in which we heritage and museum professionals have been educated isn't prepared to understand the impressive amount of stories that emerged with the recent instability of the earth since they came from worlds assembled from a plurality of ontologies which make our own cosmos increasingly provincial. Once the proposition is accepted, the work of assembling a network are able to accommodate it just starts. The first step was to find people who could be gathered around the complex problems that the RMCA proposed to us. Uh, fortunately, these matters of concern have also touched this incredible and inter interdisciplinary uh, group of scholars to whom I was lucky to work with. Since then, we became even more attached once we recognized the anxieties involved in keeping the air MCA proposition alive among us. Uh, first, we needed to come to an agreement on which questions should guide our answer. After some meetings, these three questions became able to express our collective concerns. The first one, should a museum last forever? Two, do museums need to be stationary? Three, who, who, who can build a museum? Of course, museums professionals have been facing these questions for a long time with different answers. Our challenge was to articulate these questions to the RMCA proposition, especially considering the green futures and environmental justice coordinates. At some point, this design came to our mind. This drawing represents how we imagined a museum as a place erected to connect people around communitarian stories of ecological resistance. This geodesic dome can be easily built from local renewable and recyclable materials and can be moved or transformed into greenhouses or even homes. As we wrote in our bid, these spaces would house a central circle for the ex exchange of knowledge and experiences. As the geodesic dome does not require structural elements such as columns, we would have freedom in distributing exhibitors, models, project on screens, and works of art throughout the space. Taking advantage of this to better exchange exhibition experiences with local communities. This could be a carbon neutral, low cost and transient, transient museum alternative by which people from everywhere could make use of museum technologies to tell their own histories and to produce their own resistance networks. In order to conclude this presentation, I would like to talk about the most important experience we had when developing this project. The active participation of some communities of our region in the existence project taught us how these ideas could turn in, into concrete, concrete climate resistance networks. The south of Minas Gerais state was marked by the extermination of indigenous peoples and the slavery relations of production, transforming the complex and festive biointeration practices that existed here into monocultures. But monoculture never su succeeds in extinguishing these ways of life. And even today, we can find islands of resistance among cattle pastures, coffee coffee, transgenic soy, and sugarcane plantations. As noticed, as not said by our colleague, Natalino Neves da Silva, these people developed communitarian cosmoperceptions marked by ancestral heritages, which keep alive through adaptation, different forms of African and Amerindian cosmologies. It is very clear how genuine is the value these people place on biodiversity, since it's it is it is constitutive of their social and religious attachments. The three communities which welcomed our project talked to us in their own places. All of, all of them agreed with, with us about the importance of sharing their histories of resistance to an international audience, since they recognize that climate change is a planetary issue that directly impacts their daily lives. 
All of them already had the projects to preserve the memories of their struggles, but none of them include museums, which were still seen as a distant kind of institution not concerning to people like them. However, all of them understand that their practices are worthy to be in a museum, a museum of the present, as said by Tuvida, one of the roots of the Earth Women Collective members. Finally, all of them are looking forward to creating museums like the ones we imagined here. So I would like to encourage you to encourage you all to watch the videos we produced in a partnership with these communities and to support communities like these to tell their histories, offering your professional assistance. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Walter. Thank you for sharing um, the journey of that project. Um, I really would urge people to go and watch the videos on the website if you haven't yet to really connect with the stories told there. And I think when we get into having more of a conversation, we can see a lot of parallels. Um, to how we could interpret that in the Highlands as well to inspire action to the future. Um, I'll keep us moving forward just now and um, we'll invite Andy McKinnon from Ty Kerseva in North US to speak next. Andy has worked in creative and collaborative film and contemporary arts since the late 80s. He was director, cinematographer, producer of the Scottish BAFTA nominated budget feature documentary Transition, and the, which was the first Scottish documentary to make the official selection at the IDF in 2000. Andy has been arts curator at Ty Hersava since 2003, has developed the programming to focus on environmental thematics, especially around the climate crisis in recent years. US Film, based in North East, was formed in 2013 by Andy McKinnon within the Ty Hersava Trust and produces a wide range of media content. Today, Andy is here to tell us more about the Ty Hersava project lines and two current US film projects, COP26, Message in a Bottle and Message from Upernavik. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Nicola. Um, um, it's a long introduction. Um, I'm really just going to tell you a bit about the kind of uh, the projects that we've been doing um, in relation to the climate crisis um, uh, uh, recently. Our programming uh, has always been very, very much focused on the environment with a with a small e um it's part of uh it's partly to do with this with this place this island uh that uh, we live on and, and people come to visit um which is an incredibly special environment and it's a very fragile environment it's eroding uh constantly um on the western shores and um uh and, and you know the the macker habitat uh, to be found here is is you know incredibly important on a on a kind of world a world kind of scale um and historically uh, the environment has been very important to to people's lives um people are very connected with their environment uh, the land and the sea. So, uh, as I say, our, our programming ha has always been very focused on, on the environment. And more recently, it has been become particularly focused on, on the climate crisis, um, in part because as an island, uh, as I mentioned, we, we are very uh, vulnerable. Um, uh, to to sea level rise and coastal erosion and uh, increased storm surge, um, but actually our own building here has become uh, very much threatened by by those fun by those factors, um, and in fact we cannot uh, the building the lower lower floors of the building regularly flood at at peak spring tides. Um, usually in the, the spring and the in the autumn, and we can't actually develop on this site uh, anymore. So it has become really uh, a kind of a existential issue for us in particular as an organisation. Um, and 
part that was part of the reasoning behind a commissioning this artwork which I'm, I'm going to to show you um, uh, a short video of just now um, it's called lines it's a tidily activated uh, light installation that wraps around various el elements of the buildings uh, on our site um, anyway I'll, uh, I'll let the video explain a bit more about it Salo Solish Marinach, a Hachemichel Tai Taski, Ayas Yanat Elling Tai Kersival, on an Asia Tua on an Inish Gal, a Lassig Ansochain Davilus Ochjak, Gus Kuchamahud Ir Buik Blahog Nakrinia, Ir Arch in the Mara. Tokalok Tai Kersavag Hain, Glei Ashk Edachlatog, and then Loch Namatog. Ayas Marshin, and then Kunersch Valvud Agedi, Guhari Lestidum. Andras de Hain, Noraha Muloch Roich, and Haavud Achiang Este Yen Farsch as Ishla Gen Tokalok. Ayas Hagav and Chinat Lesahog, Tilog Eden Ladochsha. Hadroch hicha ayas tiraman gyaori nesmisa, a gal yanachlatihin bunguisht ear, a kilahuk barach krianuk genachlatihin, ayas tulchen er nehalingen beka e shalaki. An udin yang chiang bia er nehalingen ounce a naumri chach. Rai iri eren luch eling ilnlinjach, peka niti verta, ayas timo aho, oper eling a kruachug, a goprichug lesho vur lan, er son ara genya a haring er marajetig a vud eri gumor, murachurshing stat er blachug nakrinya, a ha leg en jug ek napolichen, ayas a gaurachug gvil ira namara a geri. Hanna Mielchen de Luchtel er in Stalo Solisha Eichging an den Eisch. Eis ne Mielingen de Hlui er in Tull von der Ha Jalavan Eis Videoen er in Golvidel er Lenya. So um, I hope that gives you a bit better idea of um, uh, of the, the lines installation. It, it really has um, helped raise awareness, not just locally, um, about uh, our, our you know particular predicament and, and sea level rise and uh, in in general, uh, but it. it as it said in the video, I mean, it has really gone viral. It won a, a design boom uh, top public art uh, in 2019 award. Um, and, you know, has, we've had news crews from, from all over the world really uh, coming to, uh, to do features on it. Um, and so I, I think it, you know we're really pleased with it. It was it was initially conceived as a temporary 
artwork, but uh, I think partly because it's been so successful uh, and partly because uh, the, the issues it's addressing haven't gone away and aren't likely to go away in the any time soon. We, uh, you know, we're going to uh, continue to, uh, to 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 have the the installation. Um, that, uh, yeah, as I say, it, it's really helped raise awareness locally um, and with our visitors uh, to the centre. And it's been, uh, you know, I think when people find out that it's it's tidally activated that really kind of fires the imagination and uh, you know really uh, brings it home what what the piece is about so currently um we are uh our, our programming over the over the last year has largely been uh around uh, the climate crisis and especially in the in the lead up to um, uh, to COP twenty six, um, but going going back a bit, I uh, found a, a message in a bottle. In fact, here it is: the message in the bottle. Um, I found this message in a bottle um, on a beach uh, on the western shore here in North East, um back in two thousand and six. And it, the message is from a guy in Greenland who um, uh, was on a hunting trip far in the north of Baffin Bay. And the, the hunting was very success, unsuccessful because the uh, climate change was affecting uh, the kind of migratory patterns of both uh, whales and, uh, uh, and land mammals. Um, and ever since I found this uh, this message, uh, I was keen to uh, to make contact with Niels, who who put the message in the bottle, and um, uh, I spent uh, much of the last decade trying to trying to get in touch with him, and eventually did uh, directly uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, well, in, in 2018 and managed to uh, get some funding to to go to Greenland to to meet him and and to start making a film project about uh, climate change and how it affects uh, how it affects life in Upernavik where he's from um, and how it affects us here in in, in North Uist. And um, their their situation, I I, I really uh, came to understand that the, the re reality of, of climate change is different uh, for all of us. Um, actually, in uh, certainly in, in northwest Greenland, where he's from, it's like three hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle. Um, warming seas is actually bring huge positive impact uh, to the, their lives there because of inc you know uh, increased halibut fishing industry um, and although they can see that in the even just in the in the medium term there will be much more negative impacts uh, of polar ice melt that actually uh, you know currently they were they were kind of enjoying some some benefits from it. So I, uh, I started to make this film project. Unfortunately, the uh, uh, COVID uh, kind of meant being unable to to return to to Greenland to to complete the film as yet. I'm still hoping to do that uh, in the next year or so. But on the back of that project, we came up with a, a kind of impact project to try and raise awareness uh, of the film and, and the issues it was, uh, it was talking about. Um, and uh, 
came up with a, a project called Message in a Bottle, or actually cl Climate Change Message in a Bottle, which uh, is really um, is a participatory film project. And we've been working with a Strathclyde University Centre for Environmental Law and Governance. And uh, and the and island innovation um, and Scottish Youth Action and the Scottish Islands Federation and we've been uh, getting uh, video material with pupils, school pupils uh, reading out messages to COP26 to COP and we've um, a we're in the, in the process of combining this into a uh, into a film that is going to be shown at uh, at COP26. I'll just show you a short clip uh, with um, the kind of the call out um, video that went uh, went with that. And so we tried to um, encourage uh, children it, through schools. It was a, a basically a school schools based project in the main, and they were invited to go to their local beach, collect a, an empty uh, plas plastic uh, drinks bottle. Um, and to film themselves uh, giving a message to uh, to COP26 um, and uh, sh sharing a bit of, of their where they were where they came from and uh, how their beach was, was special to them. So we ended up working with over 30 schools, um, 30 schools across Scotland, plus uh, some international schools, not, not as many as we'd hoped, but Solomon Islands, Greece, um, and Greenland, uh, all the schools participated. Um, and we were, very fortunate to get a, a message of uh, support um, from uh, one certain celebrity who had a kind of interest in a message in a bottle. Hello everybody, my name is Sting and a little bird told me that you have this wonderful initiative to send messages in bottles to our political leaders so that they do something about climate change. Now that's obviously a very important subject, which you well know. So I just wanted to offer my support and sing a little song which I wrote years ago called Message in a Bottle. I'll send an SOS through the world I'll send an SOS through the world I hope that someone gets my I hope that someone gets my I hope that someone gets my message in a bottle so that was uh, it was really great to uh, get that uh, kind of very um, out of the blue support from from Sting um, and I'm just show you a little uh, clip of the of uh, well I got basically a, a kind of small trailer for for the film um, which uh, is going to be presented at COP26 uh, um, uh, playing in the, in the in the science center and we're also um, kind of still negotiating for uh, for space to to show it elsewhere um, and including a, a massive three meter high a, plastic bottle made out of plastic plastic bottles 
you know, I'll just show you this little, uh, little clip. Um, Stop making problems and start solving them. Dear delegates, I love my island and everything on it, but it will be flooded if we do nothing about climate change, and that is why we need to change our ways. Stop burning things. Dear COP26, our island is peace friend, protect our sea. Stop the cook plastic and food fusion and be a global color to sun our planet. Via COP26, this is our message. Take action now! Stop the cook plastic and food fusion and be a global color to sun our planet. Via COP26, this is our message. Take action now! Um, so it's, uh, it's it's been very, very hectic uh, couple of months pulling this project together, but it's, uh, I think, uh, some great, uh, you know, great input from uh, from all the participants. Uh, it's really, uh, it's brilliant to, brilliant to see so much awareness and uh, uh, so many demands for, for action. That, uh, that are going to be contained in this film. Anyway, I think I'm probably running out of time and, uh, uh, and things to say, so I'll probably just stop there. Thank you, Andy. And um, that was such a, an amazing and inspiring example of how museums can have a role in amplifying kids' voices, um, as well as just the amazing serendipity of you finding that bottle on the North Coast beach and it leading to all of this. So thank you for sharing that with us and I look forward to hearing more in the, the q and I'll come to our final speaker, um, who is Jenny Woolcock, uh, the Collections and Engagement Manager from Royal Cornwall Museum. Jenny is a key part of the team leading the direction that the Royal Cornwall Museum are taking towards their ambitions to meet set net zero by 2030 within their own organisation. And in providing a space for our communities to consider what the climate emergency means for them. Excuse me. Today, Jenny will be speaking about two of Royal Cornwall's current climate projects. Um, one being the Climate Conversations, which is a display of community responses to the museum's collection, which with a focus on climate change and the impact humans are having on the planet. And also the Tony Foster Fragile Planet, which is a watercolour journey into wild places. Um, Jenny, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, and yeah, thank you all for being here and for taking the time to listen to us about um, our projects which we're going to take this year. Um, I'll start off by kind of giving you a little bit of information about um, RCM and some of the changes that have taken place for us not relating to climate in the last few years, which have kind of led us to draw several threads together um, in a way that's kind of driven us forward. Um, perhaps in a pathway that we hadn't initially imagined, um, but it does take climate as, as quite a central focal point. Um, so since the uh, recession in 2008, our museum has been really heavily affected by financial difficulties, which reached ahead um, in 2019. And we decided at that point that we needed to stop, um, make some real significant change. Um, uh, otherwise, we'd, we'd basically go past the point of no return. Um, and we're a 203 year old institution now uh, and we've been here uh, you know collecting uh, Cornish heritage and heritage from further afield which are uh, other sets of issues that we're also addressing um, as another key focus uh, over the next five years and beyond. Um, so really this needed to to happen in order to enable us to get to where we are now which has resulted in a really positive change but it, uh, in the outset it meant that we lost uh, the majority of our team um, at one point, the RCM team was four people. Um, and so it, it's been a real process of change for us. And that's coincided with a lot of the social, economic and ecological changes that are happening uh, at the forefront 
uh, at the moment. So it's, it's prompted this step change towards a uh, major transformation. We have new board members. We have a new chair of the board uh, who's really passionate about lots of these various issues that we're hoping to tackle. Um, it's prompted a new team structure uh, in which our new mission and our key focuses and priorities are it, they're hired with those at the forefront. We write our job description on, on these things rather than tackling more general needs. Uh, it's, it's aimed to balance both of those aspects. Um, and we also have the dual leadership of Bryony Robbins, who's our creative director, and uh, Jonathan Morton, who's our CEO. And together they are bringing a whole new way of working into the organisation. Um, obviously, post-2019, pandemic struck. Um, and we realised that we, we absolutely have to do things differently. Um, we were very underprepared for delivering anything digitally. Um, our infrastructure here is, is working towards that, but it's not particularly supported. Um, and we also realised that in terms of our reach and our audiences, we, we were just not hitting the targets and we weren't delivering what we really should should be delivering. Um, so when we returned to work, we came back with a few more team members and we also uh, started our first, first year into the uh, trainee curator programme. Um, and Georgia Murphy, she brought in uh, some really interesting uh, networks and contacts. And one of those was to draw us to the discussion about the Gorilla Museum, which is, it started in London, uh, which is where she had moved back down from. And we trialed that, taking objects out into the community, um, not necessarily presenting professional interpretation as it were, but allowing people to give their own interpretation and to talk about these objects. Uh, and then we drew that into uh, this year's programme, which was focusing on climate emergency. Um, last year's programme was focusing on well-being and bringing people back into the museum and having the museum space as a, as a place of inspiration and a place to grow and develop uh, as people and to kind of get back into the world having been locked away because of the pandemic um, and what it really highlighted to us the Gorilla Museum project was how much people wanted to connect with heritage but not in a way that's necessarily strictly directed um, but also to be able to discuss really complex issues such as climate emergency in a way that's safe, it's an open space and without necessarily major judgment, we are all here very passionate about uh, climate emergency and becoming greener as people both at home and professionally. Um, but we also recognise that there are so many people who don't feel that way and equally, you know, trying to trying to ram it down people's throats is generally really unsuccessful. And what we really need to be doing is encouraging organic growth and change in mindset. So that really influenced the way that this year's exhibitions then move forward. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what we're moving towards as an organisation is, is to be a place where people can have debates and open discussion um, and we will, you know, kind of gently nudge people towards these, these views. We, we hope that that is working. It certainly seems to be. Um, but it's really important to us that equally we're not, we're not driving people away. Because if you do immediately drive people away, there is absolutely no opportunity for them to learn from these things. So it's drawing them in uh, and then, you know, trying to help them. And, and by no means we're not trying to not to challenge people. Challenging people is, is always a very helpful tool. Um, but I think with the way that the world is currently sitting, uh, that can be really difficult and, and more challenging for people. So we're really hoping to, to bring those, those ideas and concepts to people in a way that is, is helpful to them and allows gradual change rather than um, you know, trying to promote these really hard uh, notions that people will shy away from if they're too difficult. Um, so hopefully that's that's been really clear on our exhibitions. Um, so Georgia then moved on to do climate conversations, which brought the um, interpretations that people had given to us about our objects um, back into the museum. She set up a label wall where people were able to write their own labels for the objects under the uh, kind of template and um, theme of climate emergency. So she selected all the objects based on um, really solid grounding in climate emergency and what these, ob these objects do tell stories about climate. But she, rather than setting out this really heavy kind of caption based 
interpretation. She didn't put any of that in and just allow people to talk about it themselves. And we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of responses. Uh, within the first two weeks, we had more than 300 responses written up on the wall. We had lots of people asking us about it, lots of people contacting us. We've had loads of feedback relating to it, and it's been really, really helpful. Um, in terms of thinking about how we need to be operating as a museum in the future, as well as in terms of knowing how people are responding to climate emergency in Cornwall. And of course, many of these people were tourists because this opened in the summer. Um, so in Cornwall and further afield, and it's just been a really useful tool in so many ways. Um, while this was all going on, we also worked with Tony Foster, who's a watercolour artist. Um, he's quite well known in the US and he has a foundation um, in California. Uh, and we opened an exhibition with him featuring uh, around 50 of his paintings um, and he is an environmentalist uh, as well as an artist and he's, he's travelled all over the world trekking through the wilderness um, and capturing these landscapes and vistas that he's come across that are really important to him and really exemplified the beauty of nature. Um, but he also very vocally uh, advocates for the environment in terms of how fragile that is and um, the effect of, of human activity upon it. And he was really keen for a, his artwork obviously to be displayed, but really the core message of that was that our planet is fragile and that we need to be doing more. Um, so that in, in and of itself was just a really interesting project because he acknowledges that he has traveled all over the world in order to do this, which obviously can contributes to the issue. Um, but in doing so, he will spend thousands in some cases of pounds extra in order to travel in a way that has a much less impact on the planet. Um, and so he has all of these life stories that really exemplify how little the majority of us do engage with nature um, and also just how amazing the environment is and uh, he makes you feel excited to do something positive when you speak to him uh, to do something positive about climate change rather than making you feel down in the dumps and then it's all doom and gloom which I think is again really useful because sometimes all this negative messaging although it's really important and we should be challenging the public um, in some cases, we've found that actually this just drives people away and they just don't want to know because burying your head in the sand can sometimes be a lot more comforting than facing head on the issues that we're all facing. Um, so between those two exhibitions, we've been really lucky to um, have such a broad spectrum and encourage debate and discussion. Um, we have also currently got an exhibition on uh, called Citizens of Love and Rage, which is by a photographer called Gav Golder. Um, and he took portraits of uh, Extinction Rebellion um, protesters who were arrested. And he got to know them personally. He took their stories as well as their photos. Um, and the photographs on display are really poignant and personal. And you can really see the pain and the anger in, in people's eyes um, as they kind of stare out at you. And, and this is where that challenging aspect comes in, that you have, you have to confront the faces of these people as you walk into the gallery. And um, we've also put them uh, blown up in the windows as well, facing out onto the street. So all of these things tie together to enable us to, to kind of encompass all of those aspects of climate emergency and, and how that's affecting everyone. Um, we've also kind of had to acknowledge our own um, contribution to this as an organisation. Um, as I said before, we're a 203 year old organisation. We do have links to uh, colonialism and slavery and, um, you know, exclusion and oppression because of that. Uh, and we're working to be a, a lot more transparent about it and B, to find the best route forward and how to, to deal with the sensitive collections that we hold and also to, to be more involved with the communities and hopefully be generally community led as a museum. Um, but equally, on top of that, the Cornish innovation aspect, um, Cornish innovations towards STEAM, for example, these are massively contributing to the technologies that we have today and of course that means that that's contributing to climate emergency so we're trying to tackle all of these different aspects of climate emergency that we as an organization have been directly um, involved with uh, and also trying to forge a way forward that will enable people to learn from that and and make positive changes and positive choices 
Um, in terms of the building itself, uh, we're looking to make it more environmentally sustainable. Um, we're planning to change our lighting throughout, um, not just displays, but throughout all of our office spaces. Um, we're also hoping to get photovoltaic cells on the roof, um, but we're a listed building, so this becomes uh, quite difficult, but we're hoping to, to forge forward um, and be able to provide our own energy. Um, and we're also looking at reducing our water usage and finding new ways to use um, grey water as well. Um, one of those may be community garden planting, uh, using it for irrigation, uh, and the other is to um, kind of change how we're using our outdoor spaces and, and how the community is able to engage with the museum as a building and uh, not just as an organization um, and part of this has involved a uh, partnership with Cornwall Wildlife Trust um, looking to highlight Cornish ecology um, the importance of issues uh, in this area um, specifically seawater pollution um, and although tourism is a really important factor into our survival as an area um, it also contributes very heavily to the pollution that goes on around here. I can say as a Cornish person that in the winter months, uh, there is significantly less pollution and litter than there is in the summer months. Um, and that's something that we all need to work together on addressing rather than pointing the finger. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's also looking at um, hedge destruction and overdevelopment. So it's really a case of working together and using these projects to highlight that and also to to kind of engage with all of the different aspects of how climate emergency is affecting us all. Um, there is a video which highlights um, the two major exhibitions, the Climate Conversation, which I've mentioned. So um, if anybody would like to view that, I'll post the link in the chat. Um, and obviously, if you have any questions, do let me know. It's quite a lot that I've covered in that. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a really, really, interesting year and for me I've been here for five years and seeing this transformation change into into a positive direction has been really fantastic um, and I hope that that's come across today thank you thanks so much Jenny sorry we're a wee bit short and tight on time there but thank you um, for sharing all your projects and the motivations behind them and um, thank you to to all our speakers that's the sort of end of the first um, little section today and there's so much to unpack there from the, their words and pictures and um, so it's time for the Q&A and I'd like to invite my colleague Helen Avenel who's the Projects and Partnership Manager at MHH to moderate this section of today's events. Helen. Thanks Nicola and um, thanks to all the speakers just really thought-provoking and illuminating in so many different ways on um, all the there's lots of parallels, I think. I could see all the speakers kind of nodding at each other, the different presentations. I think there's lots of overlaps. So yeah, really um, happy to open the floor. If anyone has any questions from the audience, if you want to raise your hand um, and you, you're welcome then to um, either unmute and show your video or just unmute. Um, I'll maybe kick off while people are just kind of maybe um, gathering thoughts with a question so from my perspective and thinking about where we're coming from, from Highland Museums, um, most of us uh, across the Highlands being in small museums, I'm wondering whether there's something around smaller museums being able to be more radical in their thinking and then maybe some of the larger institutions that we expect to take the lead um, with the messaging that for smaller museums, although capacity, there's lots of other issues, can can smaller museums be more radical? I don't know. I'll ask maybe Andy first as a kind of Highland uh, museum uh, and, and an institution who who has been really radical in its uh, its approach and thinking, maybe consciously or sometimes unconsciously. What are your thoughts, Andy? Yeah, I, d I don't know what, if it's because we're small. Um, I think our unique location um, definitely is a factor in. Um, you know, all, all our all our programming um, is is built around where we are, and that 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 is central to to what we do. Um, so I don't know if that frees us up to uh, just respond to to. Um, to that, uh, you know, to just 
in a you know in a, in a more unique kind of way that is going to be just different to to everyone else but yeah don't really know i'm thinking jenny um you mentioned about the kind of transformation that your museum's undertaken it sounds like it came from a place of crisis maybe that the the kind of crises of different natures um sort of pushed your organization to rethink quite radically but your makeup what 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 allowed you to apart from the fact of having to i suppose the kind of like the crisis that allowed that to happen and to be so transformational in your thinking as opposed to kind of just let's try and exist and carry on surviving as a as an organization yeah I'm keen to hear your your thoughts around that yeah i think um you know having a basically a complete change in team was um quite important within that and i realized that you know most organizations would neither want to or need to do that um but i think also the fact that everybody here has that similar mindset of you know we need to be working on climate crisis we need to be doing better as an organization and as people and we all try to uphold these ideas at home and at work um, but also recognizing that not everybody is able to to do that in the same way um, particularly with our publics the um, the economic divide in Cornwall is really pronounced and so it's recognizing that not all of our visitors will be able to for example switch to solid bar shampoo because it's eight pounds a bar in comparison to ATP for a bottle. Um, so it's, it's trying to incorporate all of those aspects and that openness and that community sense. Uh, and I think everybody here has that mindset, which has been really useful. And I know that can be really difficult, particularly when you've got more longstanding teams um, and their opinions might differ. Um, but we as cheesy as it sounds, did a lot of team building exercises. We spent a lot of time with each other, talking, discussing, and uh, acknowledging difference of opinions, which has been really useful because nobody felt pushed out or that they weren't valid because they didn't share the same opinion. Um, yeah, so I guess in a way it was born out of crises, several crises, financial, uh, you know, the pandemic and climate, um, but equally it's had a really positive effect on us. Um, and I think a lot of that is just to do with the fact that we had open discussion and we accepted each other in the process. Hmm. I'm seeing from, from Liz in the chat, she's mentioning, and I think it's something our, our Highland Museums will probably be able to nod to. I think Siobhan had already from Opal Museum had mentioned that about how can smaller museums make these changes with, with limited resources. And that's a comment that, that Liz has made, you know, small museums often are able to be a bit more, um, able to pivot and kind of act more quickly because they have smaller you know governing bodies and so forth and they're less bureaucratic but often have limited resources but I guess some of what you're saying Jenny is not always about money yes there's other resources needed but that maybe brings me to you Walter because your project is really inspirational because it's really about yes small communities it's not about large projects um, in terms of funding, it's creating on the ground. So yeah, I'm keen to hear your, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Thank you, Helen. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a museum specialist. Uh, we are thinking in radical ideas about museums, uh, uh, departing from my experience is studying uh, national museums here in Brazil, uh, which are the, the models from local museums in, in, in small cities, for example. And uh, we are thinking uh, of how these local communities have, have uh, uh, a system, systems of knowledge uh, which are created uh, in resistant to this kind of transformations and ur urban uh, urban uh, constitutions that bring bring us the Anthropocene and climate change, for example. So the, their existences are kind of knowledges that uh, directly uh, uh, indicates ways to, to live in among the ru ruins uh, that this kind of modern way of life uh, 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 left to us. 
Uh, so the, the model of museums we are proposing in this project is as uh, it's a kind of alternative uh, possibility uh, without depending on uh, institutions, larger institutions or larger museums. Uh, because uh, the, the whole idea is that the, the, the our communities can build uh, their own museums and share their own histories without depending of larger institutions. Uh, because in Brazil, uh, you know, we are a large country and the, the, the great majority of institutions are located in great cities, distant for, uh, from these communities. And uh, besides that, the, these institutions are perceived as uh, elitist uh, institutions and uh, it's it's specific specific from uh, uh, our country, so we try to imagine ways uh, in which these communities can be uh, uh, can can start uh, uh, can can be the protagonist of this uh, this production of museums and sharing uh, histories among them, constituting a network of resistance to climate change. Because the, the, the own way of life of these peoples are a form of, uh, to resist to, to climate change. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just an idea uh, 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 produced from the real experiences uh, we have here in our local communities. But uh, we faced uh, 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 important challenging challenges uh, when, when, when sending our exhibition to Glasgow. So we have to learn how to, to construct an exhibition which is carbon neutral. And it's, 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 a, it's a very challenging uh, uh, experience uh, since uh, it's, it's, uh, there is a lot of, of, of uh, aspects involved in constructing an uh, exhibition, uh, which implicates in, in how we, we uh, we connect to this larger infrastructural network that that possibly uh, that that allow us to create to produce this kind of exhibitions. So uh, uh, I, I have I, I have not an answer to this question, but I have I, I think the uh, may uh, to 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 bring communities to actively part participate on this uh, museum projects, it's an important way to try to understand how it's possible to, to, to execute. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Walter. Um, do we have any other kind of, does anyone have a, a hand raised? I realize you've kind of got a discussion going, if there's anyone who wants to come in with a, a direct question. I know that um, I can see Siobhan mentioned about kind of that idea of working as a collective or working as individual organizations. Rowan, I don't know if you've got, if you've got any thoughts on, on that. So there you are, Siobhan, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, it was just to see whether they've had experience of having individual museums having just as much of an impact as having collectives or big museums, or does it really need to be a collective a voice that goes forward through it. Rania, do you want to, to mention? Yeah, well, I think it's a really great question. And I think it depends on certain aspects and what you define as impact, right? I think as a sector, we can make a very powerful difference. But I wouldn't underestimate, kind of going back to the first question, I have worked in small museums and I've worked in large museums. And I think in a small organization, I know there's a lot of resource challenges but you can make such a difference that in a larger facility the th I was just reminded of this working on this exhibition as well there's a lot of politics that really um can really get involved in your exhibition in a bizarre way just um for our our own reimagining museums for climate action it is going, and the Glasgow Science Center is going to be used as a facility for hosting some of the COP events itself so there was um, you know, politicians essentially looking at the exhibitions and saying, do we want this? Do we not? Can we, you know, like shut it off essentially and prevent people from walking through these spaces? 
So it's, it's bizarrely political at times, but I really do think as a sector, we're very well trusted. And especially in an age of fake news, I think local facilities, local museums and local news can make a huge difference. Thanks, Rob. Do you have any thoughts on that, Andy, in terms of being, you know, have you had any kind of kind of come back the kind of um, conversations, you know, by by raising this issue you know, or different issues, you know, do you get in terms of kind of the uh, conversation that it creates? How do you manage? Do you manage that or do you allow that to kind of just be quite free? And I'm, I'm thinking I'm just only because I, you know, we have the the the. Uh, uh pervasive facebook you know where and um, social media where you know comments you know you put project out there and it's and it's there in the world how do you manage the the commentary around that well i think um you know al almost almost any um comment is uh certainly any comment that we've had is, is more than more than welcome i mean i think where um, where we need to uh, raise awareness and uh, um, and maybe uh, create more understanding around any issue really um, I think the only the only way to do that really is through uh, through a kind of open open dialogue um, uh, I, I put a bit in the, in, in the chat there about how actually COVID has has enabled us to, because it's forced us to to use um, digital means more to uh, to deliver our you know our programming um, with on online uh, events and um, uh, uh, etc. That, you know, we actually we actually reach a, a wider audience uh, because of that. So, um. how has that been for you, Jenny? In terms of your, you know, the the relationships with your local communities and your kind of changes that you've made, how how does that kind of relate in terms of those conversations that then are started in your community? They've been positive and or ne and or negative. How do you manage that? Yeah, we've had a combination of both, <laughs> which is inevitable. Um, but it's been generally, um, you know, really interesting and eye-opening experience. And we do try to take in both aspects, you know, positive and negative. Um, we're quite lucky that we now have a communications and interpretation uh, manager, and she's brilliant. She's worked in the sector in Cornwall for many years, um, and she's really able to to kind of draw silver linings out of any conversation which is really useful um and in a way one of our long-standing volunteers she whenever we do have these kind of team meetings she always does draw in these kind of opposing opinions and she does it in a way that is really thought-provoking um and it enables us to consider those different opinions um in a different way and in a really useful way so it's really good that again we've got this team member who who draws those different thoughts out so that we're able to to look at these negative comments slightly differently um but i mean yeah we, we're still trying to deliver more digitally which has been a challenge for us because as i said we just don't have the infrastructure to support it just yet but i totally agree covid has made us all realize how much we need to communicate more and better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Walter, do you have any thoughts on that about the kind of yeah how um, you're working different communities so, so it's across the whole country? Do how do those how do your communities come together? Have they come together kind of virtually or yeah how do they how do you communicate between your your different communities? We work with local communities in, in a more restrict region here in Brazil in the south of Minas Gerais state. So we are distant from uh, uh, 50, uh, 70 kilometers. So it's not that distant uh, yet. But uh, we, of course, we, we 
we aim to expand our project to other communities, uh, but uh, we we are facing some problems to 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 give continuity to our project because the difficult to 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 encounter to to see people because we proposed some uh, bio construction workshops that are impossible to 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 execute nowadays because of the COVID-19 surge. And uh, we are as well using uh, devices like this, uh, meeting through Zoom meetings or Google, uh, uh, Google Classroom meetings. And uh, but uh, the, the, the construction of the museums, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it uh, has hasn't uh, it, it's it's not been it's not been it, it isn't possible to 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 conduct that because uh the dis social distancing is necessary to 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 keep home because in brazil the covid 19 situation is especially bad as you probably know and uh, we are uh, struggling to find ways to keep this project going in, going uh, even in this situation. But uh, we, we have now a, a meeting with these people to know what changed uh, since we produced our videos. And uh, uh, I think, uh, I think the, 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 the online meetings is the, the way we can keep in going and thinking about how to face climate change. Uh, it's all the way for now. Thanks, Walter. I think one of the one of the really interesting questions you raised in your um, presentation was um, who can build a museum and uh, should a museum last forever? So there's some interesting um, discussion around there. Jenny, you touched on it in terms of your building being an an, an old building that requires um, yeah, there's lots of issues. Um, and, and equally, Andy, your building presents different issues because of where it is and where it's located and the challenges that the climate um, is, is giving it directly. Um, and in the chat, actually, I think one of our um, uh, participants, uh, uh, Liz mentioned about the, 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 the role that museums can, can play in terms of the building and, and what changes can be made, um, especially in old buildings. Um, and, and is there funding around that? Um, that's actually the subject of our second uh, event, which is around how um, museums themselves can um, can uh, can contribute to to, to uh, the climate crisis in terms of how it can, how they can respond and whether there's um, funding around that to support older buildings. Um, I think we're heading towards um, wrapping up time. So unless then there's any other comments, I'm just going to have a quick look in the in the chat. Um, and then Nicholas mentioned um, uh, maybe some final thoughts about how can museums inspire radical climate action. Um, so we, we might come to an end there. Um, I want to uh, thank you all as speakers um, for coming along and, and talking with us and, and, and creating conversation. I want to say thank you to um, the supporters of the event, um, supported by COP26 Conversations Fund developed in partnership with Museums Gallery Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland and Scottish Libraries Information Council. Um, please do come along to our second event, as I say at the beginning of November, where we'll be having other interesting discussions, as I say, around buildings themselves and, and museums and how, um, how they can inspire um, climate uh, action in their own communities. Um, thank you very much indeed for everybody for coming. Thanks a lot. Thanks again.